Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Jeremy Lent. Jeremy Lent's an author and founder of the nonprofit Leology Institute, dedicated to fostering a worldview that could enable humanity to thrive sustainably on the earth. The Leology Institute, which integrates system science with ancient wisdom traditions, holds regular workshops and other events in the San Francisco Bay Area. In addition to the patterning instinct, Jeremy is author of the novel Requiem of the Human Soul. Formerly, he was the founder, CEO, and chair of a publicly traded Internet company. Lent holds a BA in English Literature from Cambridge University and an MBA from the University of Chicago. So, as always, Jeremy, first off, thank you for your work, and second, thank you for being on the program. It's a, it's a great pleasure, Derek. Happy to be here today. So, I guess the first question is, um, how do cultures change? And I guess we'll use that as an introduction for people who didn't hear your previous interviews. Maybe start with an introduction through your work as it has to do with how cultures change. Sure, yeah, because um, my book you know, that came out a year or so ago, The Patterning Instinct, um, its subtitle is uh, Cultural History of Humanity's Search for Meaning. And um, actually a big chunk of the book does look at exactly this question about how cultures shift and how world views shift. Um, so uh, just a real quick thumbnail about the book itself. It goes all the way back to hunter-gatherer times, all, all the way up to the present day. And it looks about how different cultures through history have patterned meaning into the, the cosmos and how the way in which they pattern meaning actually affects their core values and how those values have actually shaped history. So I think, um, you know, I learned a lot through the research of that book to about this very question. And in the book, I did come up with a little bit of a kind of a theory of change, if you will. So um, if it sounds good to, to you, Derek, I'll, I'll sort of I'll, I'll try to give like a little snapshot of that theory so we can this use that um, sort of going forward. So, OK, well, so essentially, like I, I look at cultures um, as as complex systems, basically. Um, and something about that is that they uh, cultural ideas and values and worldviews can be very, very stable. They can stay the same for thousands of years, and they can also undergo quite rapid shifts. So the question is, what is it that leads to that kind of shift? And as I looked at it, there's actually two kinds of things that can happen. There's what you can call endogenous variable change, which means basically something shifting within the system, something sometimes within the material system of that culture that causes things to unravel and then we cohere in a different way. And then you can have like exogenous variables, like something external can happen to the society that can disrupt it so much that it leads new generations to come up with new values. So can that's... You give, can you give examples of both of those? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's think first about this kind of endogenous, uh, so something changing within a system. So a great way to look at that is actually look at maybe the biggest change that ever happened in human history, which was the rise of agriculture. So, you know, 95% of human history was spent as nomadic hunter-gatherers. And then over a period of really a couple, just a few thousand years, uh, then the, essentially the world shifted to being predominantly agricultural. And with that came fundamental shifts in values or things that we take as given now in life, like hierarchy, patriarchy, um, a sense in believing in possessions and a certain quality to wealth and wealth itself having value and specialization. So much of what we take for granted happened only with agriculture. So that's an example of where uh, it's not like some uh, a bunch of people, hunter-gatherers, said, hey, let's settle down and do agriculture. But in a few places around the world, conditions were such that uh, the nomadic hunter-gatherers became sedentary. And when they became sedentary, it led to certain things beginning to shift in terms of their norms. You'd start to have accumulate more possessions. And if somebody worked hard on, um, on something and actually had more possessions at the end of their life. They wanted to bequeath it to the next generation, and that's helped patriarchy to begin. And so you began, when agriculture first happened, it, it sort of, it happened to humans. It's almost like humans actually uh, domesticated themselves. And then once that started to happen, they had to start to work hard to keep the fields uh, 
okay for the next crop and uh, worry about the floods and sacrifice the gods. And so everything changed, but it happened within the material culture first. So a, a couple things. One is when I lived in Spokane, I had chickens and ducks, and I would often uh, go get uh, – there was this market that I would dumpster dig at to get food for the chickens and ducks. And they, they got to know me, and they would um, – then save a lot of their um, produce that they were going to throw in the trash for me. And so I would show up, and I would sometimes get a truckload of watermelons. And my point is that um, I was at the time also a commercial beekeeper. The commercial beekeeping, I would sell my honey. It was, this is mine, I made it, never mind the fact that the bees made it, but I worked for it. On the other hand, when I had uh, a truckload of watermelons, I literally would drive down the street and just stop and say, hey, you want some watermelons? And my point is that was a tangible example in my own mind of the dis difference between um, me having sort of an agricultural mindset where I was going to be more stingy with the products I had worked hard to create – versus things that were essentially a gift from the universe that I was then delighted to just share with everyone with no thought of ownership. Yes, I like that distinction. And and it's actually, that is how hunter-gatherers, uh, when they were nomadic, viewed things. They sort of saw nature as really like a giving parent. And that was their core metaphor they used for looking at the natural world, which led then to this notion that you're meant to share. And, uh, and, and so that it was this big, big community spirit. And if somebody would join from outside, they, they, they'd use the word relative for that person, even if they weren't actually family once they began to stay with them. So you did see that big shift in values. So, and, and so that's a example of an endogenous variable that led to, uh, before long, new cultures arising with completely different sets of values. And I'll give an example of, an exogenous variable, so something coming from outside the culture that shifts it. So basically, we can, I, I think China is a great example. Uh, and China for millennia uh, was based on a very, very stable set of values. They had an underlying uh, metaphor of nature that I call um, the um, harmonic web of life. They saw everything as existing in this kind of resonant web, and humans and nature and the gods all being uh, connected and kind of through the, the Tao. And there was a sense of really um, respect for all the different ways in which things interrelate. So that was how China remained so stable for so long. And then in the 19th century, when the West had their scientific uh, revolution, which gave them these sort of empowered ways of being, and then the industrial revolution was taking place, they kind of came and they never actually conquered China as they did in other parts of the world, but they essentially uh, dominated China, and they humiliated the leadership. And so China became uh, essentially a failed state. It was really falling apart as a result of these incursions from Western powers. So you'd have new generations then in China young people in the beginning of the, the 20th century would like discard the values of their parents and their ancestors. And they'd say, this is a screwed up system. And they'd buy into, say, a Western myth of uh, Darwinian survival of the fittest. And they'd say, you know, we need to get stronger because that's the, where, where it's at. And so China then began to import ideas and values from the West. So communism is, of course, a, um, a Western export to China. It certainly didn't arise there, but it got sort of transformed into Maoism. And, and then you see that even right now, where as communism began to fail, the new Communist Party essentially imports the values of capitalism and then out-capitalizes the capitalists in terms of the current, uh, you know, what, what we've seen in the last couple of decades. So that's an example of where you see a society get affected from the outside, and then within a generation or two, totally new values can become dominant in the uh, young people that arise in this new reality. So that, that having been said, I think, you know, that's a little bit kind of theoretical. Um, but then it leads to thinking about how, what, what can we sort of learn from that? And what I think is so important, there's a, uh, a very powerful um, 
systems view of change in not just human systems, but actually any ecological system, any living system that exists. It's called the adaptive cycle. And it looks at how um, things can become very, things can essentially go to a, through a growth phase and then become very stable. And it's called a conservation phase. And that can be, they can be stable for millennia even. But then when things begin to unravel, you go through what's called the release phase, when they un unravel way quicker than anybody is necessarily expecting. And it feels chaotic. It feels terrifying because all the old things that got taken for granted start falling apart. And after that unraveling, it, you lead to what's called a renewal phase. And a way to think about this is like think about, for example, like a forest. Um, and you can have a, a forest that can be very stable and strong and healthy for incredible, you know, long, long, long time. But then maybe the undergrowth gets to be overgrown. And, and then at one point, you might have a lightning storm and, and you get a massive forest fire. And everything, you know, most everything burns down. And then you, and so that's like the release phase. But then you have this, renewal time when, for example, winds can blow new seeds into that new forest as it's beginning to reemerge. And that's when whatever um, new things that could never have embedded themselves in the old system can suddenly become dominant in the new system as it begins to arise. So I think that's a very valuable model for us to think about now as we, as we talk today about our own culture and how change can happen. So I'm thinking I'm thinking of I'm still back a little bit on the endogenous and exogenous. So if you have so when when the Black Death came through Europe, um, then um, that led to certain social changes. Uh, I, I've read that that um, helped to make people less trustworthy of the natural world. Um, so would that be, would that be one of those exogenous changes you're talking about? It would be, but I would view that even though it was profound when it happened, I'd view that as a more superficial change than the kind of deep worldview changes that I'm talking about. So, yeah, if you look at, uh, European society before the Black Death and after the Black Death, they still believed in Christianity, they still believed in heaven and hell, they, I mean, the core beliefs that they had uh, were not fundamentally different. <clears throat> there was a different tonality to them, of course, during the Black Death, there was this really terrible focus on uh, the, you know, on the hell part of things, and the sense of uh, the negative qualities, and maybe some loss of faith in the natural world, but the fundamental way in which the natural world was viewed in Christendom, I don't think changed uh, that significantly from when you have the beginning of Christianity until the scientific revolution. And that's an example of a real true worldview shift is the scientific revolution, which is, again, that's, I would call another endogenous change where um, shifts in ways of thinking about things uh, actually happened through an emergence of different technologies kind of changing at the same time, different ways of thinking kind of pulled together to create change from the inside. So this, this actually brings up a, I'm just going to, going to do a little, uh, a short spew on racism and then, and then maybe you can make sense of what I say. And that's, we have in the United States, uh, in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, we had chattel slavery. And there was, that was an obvious manifestation of a white supremacism and a white entitlement to the lives and labor of people of African descent. And then the American Civil War, made it so that uh, chattel slavery was no longer um, legal. And it only took like 10 years for, because the underlying stories hadn't changed, it only took about 10 years for the Jim Crow laws to develop. 
which were ways to maintain white entitlement to the lives and labor of, of people of African descent. And then once that gets, uh, gets responded to, then, you know, we move toward the, start moving toward the prison industrial complex. And my, my point is just that, um, it's, it seems a lot of times that you have these underlying, um, forces, underlying somethings that, uh, that we can think we've made a dramatic shift, but there's a way that the underlying, in this case, bigotry ends up finding a way to manifest again. Yes, <clears throat> I I think that's true, and I think maybe what's helpful is to think in terms of layers of changes, and there's there's kind of superficial layers, there's kind of fairly deep layers, and then there's these really foundational layers, and so when we look at, uh, for example, what you just described, I see those things happening. I mean, they're more than superficial. They were pretty significant changes, but they were mid-level changes. They didn't change foundational views. And so, as we know so uh, egregiously and so sadly in this country, there is still this, like, core um, set of values shared by an unfortunately large number of people in this country of white supremacy. And, uh, you know, underlying racism or explicit racism. And that's until something changes more significantly on that fact. We, we don't have the kind of foundational shifts. And that's where it can just morph. It can look one way from one generation to another, but it's the same underlying values there. And I actually do think that values can shift. And I think can, uh, a wonderful, um, example of um, shifts in values is if we look at uh, a similar, uh, t even more excruciatingly terrible episode of Nazism in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. And, and there you see something different. You see a new generation of Germans growing up in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, as they, like, first, their, their sort of history was almost kept secret from them. And then as they began to really, like, probe into what happened, they, there was almost like a, a values revolution against their parents. And that was like, how dare you, like, keep this secret from us? And there was this real shift in norms in the culture to the point that now, you know, if you walk uh, along the street in a German city like Berlin or whatever, there might be there'll be random plaques, like uh, bronze plaques you see on the sidewalk, um, commemorating a Jewish family who might have lived in that house or whatever, and who got, um, yeah, just, who got exterminated in the camps. And there's this sense in which the culture itself actually went through a period of more, of grieving, of recognition of crimes, and then and, uh, expiated that to some degree and was able to move on forward. That's something that the United States has not even come close to in the area of racism. And I think that that's the kind of thing that is needed to happen uh, before it can really look at a fresh start. So how – okay, now, now that you've brilliantly laid out um, some of these ways that these worldviews can change – or you've, you've provided a, a superstructure for us to help understand them. How, how do they change? Yeah. How, how, how do they change? Well, I think that one of the ways in which they change is when the old stories and the old values of a particular culture no longer work. They no longer make sense given the realities that especially younger generations uh, are experiencing. And I've, I focus a lot on generations here because many people get very fixed in their views. And oftentimes when you're looking at like paradigm shift, the sort of older generation oftentimes has to sort of die out, if you will, before you get this really transformational shift going uh, around the, uh, the entire society. So the question is, um, you know, like if you look back at what I was saying before, you know, when China was getting uh, dominated by Western powers, the old values no longer worked. And young people would say, we don't accept what we're being told. We've got to find our own way. So where I find both 
a sense of dismal despair and a sense of hope at the same time is the fact that the old stories are no longer working in our current culture. And we see that, obviously, across the board. We see that in terms of climate breakdown. We see that in terms of the devastation being caused to the natural world <clears throat> beyond uh, just the climate itself. We see that in the unbelievable inequalities of our time when the six wealthiest men in the world own as much wealth as the entire lower half of the world's population. It's just so mind-blowing. Um, and people's lives are no longer working. And, you know, I don't, I mean, almost everyone listening to this will know exactly what I'm talking about, especially among younger generations. Um, the, the, like, the economy has been created now where uh, unless you're incredibly wealthy to begin with and privileged, life is no longer working. And young people aren't accepting to a, a greater and greater degree the myths that they're told about the world. And that's where I think is that we see the seeds of profound fundamental shift in values. But it can only happen when there is a coherent set of alternative values that those young generation can turn to that do make sense, that actually do explain and give meaning to the new realities that they're living every day. You know, this all reminds me of one of my favorite quotes ever. And this is from Joseph Campbell in his book, The Mass of God, uh, Creative Mythology. For those in whom a local mythology still works, there is an experience both of accord with the social order and of harmony with the universe. For those, however, in whom the authorized signs no longer work, or if working, produce deviant effects, there follows inevitably a sense both of dissociation from the local social nexus and of quest, within and without, for life, which the brain will take to be for meaning. Right. I think that's true. And then, then of course, one of the questions comes, well, how does the power shift? If the people in power are the ones who are okay with things, then how, does that just continue indefinitely? Or what is it that causes that power to shift to the people who are not okay, who are looking for something different? So was that an, a question you're asking me, or is that a rhetorical question that I think you're going to answer? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> um, I'm sort of putting it out there. And I do... I do have um, some views on that. Um, and, well, I do think that, you know, we see uh, real significant shifts in power happen. <clears throat> Once we are in that place of that, that kind of adaptive cycle system I was talking about before. Like, so when we are in the conservation phase, when before things start unraveling, like imagine, again, the forest – all the trees and the network, the foliage that's there, some new plant is not going to have any impact on what's going on. So things have to start to unravel. And when they start to unravel, um, it becomes relatively easy um, for a new system, a new set of values to take over. So my, my point about that is that when we see things unraveling now, there's – you know, there's a, a one narrative, one response to things unraveling is to say, look, it's hopeless. We just sort of need to, dis and we just despair and just need to prepare for collapse. And I take a different perspective on this. My perspective is that now is the time when it's more important than ever to actually sow the seeds of an alternative worldview that could lead to real flourishing for humanity in the natural world. And, and really make it coherent um, for all the different elements of what that new reality can look like, to be explained really clearly, to be a light, really, for those new generations. So the, over the next couple of decades, I think we're going to see things unravel at super fast speed. It's going to be a terrifying time. Um, and the, the thing is, the real question becomes, what are the new seeds – that will actually flourish into creating that new system. Now, some of the new seeds are, um, we see expressed in places like racism and neo-fascism and the brutalism of like this current Trump regime in the States. And we see too many of these other regimes around the world right now. So we can easily fall into despair on that and go, well, look at what happened in the, in the 30s. You know, things fall apart. Um, it 
people's fears become paramount and it leads to all these terrible things. That's one scenario. And we have to take that scenario very seriously as a risk. And there's another scenario where if there is enough of us who actually uh, coming from our true felt sense of human values, our sense of life and connectedness and our sense of the possibilities. And if those are coherently put together and we focus a lot on connecting with each other, we have the possibility for a, the most powerful movement of movements that's ever existed in history that could conceivably become strong enough to be the seeds of that new, essentially a brand new kind of society. I, I like to call it um, an ecological civilization that is potentially available to us in the future. When I think about, when I think about social change, I think often of sports because one of the purposes of practicing is to make it so um, your actions are muscle memory and when you are then faced with a critical game situation you don't have to plot out what you're going to do but instead your body knows what to do and a, a good friend of mine talks about the difference between mobilizing and organizing and he talks about the Arab Spring for example about how that was so exciting that all those people rose up against oppression, but it's one thing to mobilize a million people, and it's another thing to organize them, and the winners of Arab Spring were, for the most part, the fascist organized powers. And um, this, what I'm getting at here is that I think when things are falling apart, we don't have the luxury for the most part to philosophize and that's why you and I are having this conversation now when things are still somewhat comfortable for many of us is that it seems really important to I, I think I'm just validating what you just said that I think that it's really important to lay all sorts of foundations back one of the things I talk about is that is that as patriarchal civic societies collapse violence against women often becomes more overt and more extreme. And you can think about that just when, when you know, you can look at a, a what happened when s the society collapsed in Rwanda, or you can think about when a mill closes, rates of domestic violence go up. And so one of the things that I talk about for that is that the time to try to make it so that doesn't happen is not as – people are pounding on your door, but instead the time to really work on that not happening is 10 years, 20 years, 30 years before it happens. Yes, I do think that is absolutely right, Derek. And, and just kind of riffing off that idea, you know, the, there's this really powerful notion. Um, it's like a phrase put out by Otto Sharma, and, and it's this notion of living into the emerging future. And what I what I interpret that as meaning is that, you know, many of us already have a sense of what is the possible ways in which um, a, a flourishing future can actually happen. And a lot of that is not just to do with a change in the global politics or whatever, but it's to do with a change in how we act in community, how communities um, self-organize, how communities work together. Uh, in that, um, in the kind of the sort of village concept, and also even within ourselves, how we view ourselves and how we view ourselves as connecting with others, and and really recognizing our sense of identity as being part of the community around us, and what we can do as individuals. And by the way, I'm not saying that this is sufficient in terms of what we can do, but this is one element of what we need to do in order to help to make this transformation happen, is really live into that emerging future, meaning we live the values that we want that emerging future to have as its core fundamentals. So living the values of connectivity, living the values of community, caring for others. And, and you know, even when we have our own work that we're trying to put out there, recognizing that the, this emerging future we're talking about is one of connectivity, and it's one where we also want to put our energy into helping and uplifting and amplifying the work that we see our friends and colleagues um, also doing, so that we can really create a new network for great for transformation together.
And something that we've not yet talked about today, but I think is uh, somewhat useful and also uh, quite often incredibly harmful, is uh, modern technology. And what 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 are I mean there was much made of Arab Spring being sort of quote called end quote by by activists on Facebook, but again that was a difference of mobilizing versus organizing, and so for I guess in this discussion of how do we change stories, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of of uh, modern technology as it relates to, I'm thinking especially of computers and the internet, as it relates to, and television, as it relates to changing stories and especially changing stories for the good. Yes, I think this is such a critical question. And, and of course, you know, when the internet first emerged, people saw this as this incredible opportunity for a democratization of information. And, um, and to some degree, I know, you know, it's, it's obvious now that our sort of knee-jerk reaction is to say, and, and look what happened, you know, Facebook and Google and uh, Apple and Amazon took over and, and it's all kind of game over and stuff. And I do a- agree that there's a lot of truth in that. And at the same time, it's good to remember that back in the 1960s and 1970s, um, you know, the only way in which people got their news was this centralized bureaucracy. There were these, you know, networks um, and those networks decided what came out, what went out on television, and that's how people understood what was happening in the world. And there is actually, in truth, a much greater uh, ability and greater democratization in the sense of information flow from those times. So we do need to remember that while we're looking at some of these dire consequences that we're all only too familiar with right now, there were these positive things. But I think what's important to understand about technology itself is that whether um, a new technology can be can have the potential to influence things in either a grassroots democratizing version or an autocratic centralized way, but most important is the context in which the technology develops. And when we live in a global capitalist society where the technology is instantly bought up and patented and used to make to sort of mince the next billionaire, we are going to live in a society where even potentially good technologies get used for the domination of this, of this kind of global capitalist class. Which means that we have to look at the technology and the economic structure in which it arises interactively. We can't look at one without the other. One of the things that really struck me that Jerry Mander said, back, said to me back in, gosh, 25 years ago, is that we can think that we are using the internet to organize, and we, we certainly are. And you know, email helps connect you to people, and you and I are doing this by Skype. But we have to recognize at every moment that um, transnational corporations and militaries are using those same technologies far more efficiently than we are. Well, you know, I'd push back on that a little bit. I'll tell you why. Because if you think of how structures used to work in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, 80s before the Internet, those militaries and transnational corporations already had incredibly efficient ways of communicating. So if the CEO in a, you know, a transnational with 100,000 employees, if he decides on uh, one day, I want everybody to be told that we are going to shift our incentives to from X to Y or whatever – You know, within 24 hours, 100,000 people are aware of that and are changing their behavior based on it. So they had incredible power. But back in those days, the only ways in which a grassroots organization could work is, um, you know, print out bunches of leaflets, stand on the street corner, get, you know, try try to sell newsletters, uh, send things through snail mail. So there has been a a relative shift in value since then because we do have the opportunity now for grassroots ideas to spread almost as fast as the big corporations can get their ideas out. And in fact, the big corporations themselves um, end up now having to utilize the same um, sort of meme uh, plex, if you will, through Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, to get their ideas out that we all do.
So I do think there's a shift, uh, even though we do need to remember also just on the grassroots part that for every one of uh, progressive idea that gets out there, there's also some like neo-fascist idea that also is getting out there. And because of these ways in which we're in our own silos, we become less aware of these other poisonous messages that uh, are getting equally um, sort of viral, even while we are thinking that we are, you know, engaging in this amazing sort of shift within our own um, our own silo. So we have about 12 or 13 minutes left, so it's not quite wind down time. But um, you've talked about uh, sort of crises leading to uh, dramatic shifts, um, you know, like a, a forest fire or, you know, a river flooding and moving to a different channel. And um, you talked a little bit about, uh, like, the increasing um, increasing disparity of wealth and ecological collapse. But can you be a little bit more specific recognizing the crystal ball is always cloudy, about what you mean by the crises that may lead to um, – and you also talked about the crisis of faith, that you know, the mythology is no longer working. Can you be a bit more specific about what you mean by, by the crises and, and how, how we could uh, prepare for those revolutionary moments? Yes, I think that we've begun to see some of the early uh, sort of glimmers of the kinds of crises we can expect over the next couple of decades if we just look back in the last 10 or so years. So when we had something like that 2008 um, crash that that took place, um, that is really like sort of child's play compared to the kinds of uh, financial um, – chaos that we can expect in the future. So that's one example of something where markets can exist in a certain way and everything seems kind of stable and then suddenly some, something crashes. Then we've got the examples of as climate breakdown gets to be more and more extreme and this summer uh, there's just only, again, just early hints of the extremes we're going to be looking at. There's going to be all kinds of social political and economic disruptions, the refugee crises are going to become you know, way more extreme than anything we've seen so far. Uh, we're going to have uh, economic shifts where there's um, whole areas are going to, I, I mean, and ag agriculturally, there's areas, there's going to be uh, times when food literally becomes a bigger and bigger issue in terms of grain just not being available and starvation. It's just all kinds of uh, some of the most extreme things that we can expect. And that's going to start happening on a regular basis. And so when that happens, there's going to be this feeling that will become more and more prevalent around uh, the world, like things aren't working, things are breaking down. We'll have political extremism, which we're already seeing some sense of. But again, you know, this could be only a small hint for the kinds of uh, political extremism we could expect in the in the near term future. And there's also political extremism uh, can lead to these right wing uh, and tyrannies that are taking place right now. But there can also be this upsurges swinging back in the other direction. So we've seen hopeful signs right now of um, more progressive people in the Democratic Party getting elected from grassroots campaigns, surprising everyone that um, the, you know, people who would never have been given a moment's thought as having being able to take positions of power, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or so many others recently, and suddenly becoming part of the center stage. So that's the sort of sense I mean, like things shifting from one extreme to another very, very quickly. And that's, again, is where the most important thing is for coherent messages, coherent stories, coherent values and solutions to be offered by progressive thinkers so that when there are times when actually progressive people actually can get voted into office, they have real life 
ideas to work with rather than just having to start to invent things from scratch. And when you say social change sometimes being fairly quick, um, and we we both agree completely on that notion. I don't remember it was Max Planck who said that. The thing – you said this a different way. The thing about scientific revolutions take place not because one side convinces the other, but because the adherents to one side die out. Yeah, I, I think Thomas Kuhn is oh, the that's right. person that's that right. I'm thinking of who said that, yes. Yeah. So, so – um, so what do we mean by – I'm thinking – I want to throw one more thing in, which is pe- the anthropologist Peggy Reeve Sanday uh, looked at why some cultures are high rape and some cultures are low rape. And a lot of the stuff was really interesting in terms of stories. Like if you have um, a male creator deity versus a female creator deity or a couple deity – then it's probably more likely a high rape culture. And if it's highly militarized, it's probably a highly high rape culture, et cetera, et cetera. And there was one that really slapped me in the face ever since I read this 20 some years ago, which is that if there's a history of ecological dislocation in the last several hundred years, that it's more likely a high rape culture. And mm-hmm. what that said to me, that, that, that was her, and now I'm extrapolating, is that if a culture gets highly traumatized, um, a lot of times men take it out on women. And B, that it can take a long time for the stories of a culture to fully metab- to be able to fully metabolize a trauma. Mm. And I don't know, I'm just, I'm just, part of, part of the reason I'm bringing all this up is because we obviously need to make changes very, very quickly. We need to prepare very quickly. And I love what you're saying about this rapid change. And at the same time, I just think, you know, we have made movement between the 1830s and now in terms of racism, but that's been 180 years. And yes, I hear you. I hear you. Just go, go wherever you want with any of that. (laughs) No, no, I, I I got you. And, um, and here, so here are some interesting other, sort of examples to look at in history. I'm actually, um, right now, I'm going through a biography of Thomas Paine, who I find fascinating because he wrote The Rights of Man. Uh, and, yeah, he basically barely escaped with his life uh, from getting arrested at that time. And his ideas were so revolutionary. And, you know, 150 years later, after the Second World War and the UN puts out this un- un- Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the ideas become sort of part of our nexus of what we believe a civilization should be founded on. And I find that so interesting. And it turns out that right before the American War of Independence with Britain, uh, right up to almost just a few months before the actual Declaration of Independence and the war broke out, Nobody in the United States at that time, and of course at that time it wasn't the United States, in the the colonies, nobody would even say the word independence. They were they would talk about how we've got to negotiate better terms with Britain and everything like that. And you actually you even had, um, I think Ben Franklin, who was an ambassador in France, saying, "No, don't. No one's even talking about independence or whatever. It's an unthinkable idea because the the notion, even though everyone felt it was what was needed." No, it was almost like it hadn't broken through. And Thomas Paine wrote this uh, pamphlet or a book called Common Sense, which became like this one of the most widely read things of the, of the time, almost overnight, within just a couple of months. And he was actually the first edition that came out. He was afraid to put his name on it because he just thought, he'll, yeah, it'll end up just end, ending up in jail or killed or whatever. And then he got the courage to put his name on it the next edition because the first one sold out right away. And within a few months, everyone was talking about American independence. And even then, for a few years, it looked like it was hopeless. And it was almost like a laughable idea that they could actually win against against Britain. And they did. And I think what we need to look at is time and again, um, things that seem utterly unthinkable end up somebody gets the message across. People, it's sort of really like a wildfire. It can just move through when the time is right, a whole society, and everyone then 
from goes very quickly from going, it'll never happen, to going, well, of course, it just had to happen. Yeah, and we see that in the modern day, something like same-sex marriage legalization. And I've, I have good friends who are um, same-sex who are now married who never thought they would, able to, they would be able to be married legally uh, in their lifetime. And now it's, a, well, of course, you know, I mean, with some exceptions, as, as we know, but it's, uh, it's becoming pretty much like a done deal. And you see that with women's suffrage. Uh, it's just laughable now to think uh, of women not having an equal vote to men. But Emily Pankhurst, she was being laughed at um, as this ridiculous person um, just a few years before it became uh, f fully accepted in the society. So we have to look at that, and we have to realize that that is a reason for hope. And when I say hope, I don't want that to be misinterpreted as optimism. Because honestly, I look at so many of these driving forces right now, it leads me to have like one, one sort of foot in despair uh, pretty much at all times. Uh, it's just terrifying what we see going on around us, and it's dismal. Um, and at the same time, we need to recognize that the future is not preordained. The future is actually not even uh, a, a noun. Um, you know, it's really, we can think of it uh, Douglas Rushkoff likes to say this, and I think it's a beautiful notion. The future is a verb, really, and it's a verb that all of us are actually taking part in as we do what we do, as we make our decisions, we make our choices, and we can all choose to be part of that emerging future. And I think that that is the reason why there is a possibility for some of these transformational shifts in a positive direction within our lifetimes. One of the things I love about your work is that, I mean, I don't have a lot of patience for the people who are sort of blindly optimistic, and I have even less patience for the people who are as pessimistic as I am or perhaps you are <laughs> and, who, and who then use that as an excuse for inaction because the stakes are too high and, and we don't know the future which means if there is a one one millionth of a 1% chance that you telling your crazy stories and me telling my crazy stories that someday will not be perceived as crazy, um, then we have to do it. Yes. So one last thing. We're, we're almost out of time. But so for people who have found this conversation interesting and exciting, one thing they can do is to read your book, The Patterning Instinct, and what else can they do if they want to know more about your work? Uh, you can go to the um, two places. One on the web is uh, my website, www.jeremylens.com, which looks at a lot of these ideas we've been talking through in this last hour or so um, of how change happens and looks at them um, historically. And you can also look at this website, um, www leology.org, L-I-O-L-O-G-Y. And what you'll see there is a uh, really a exploration of a different kind of worldview that could lead to long-term future flourishing for humanity on the earth. It's an integrative worldview that incorporates uh, traditional wisdom along with modern scientific uh, rigorous like systems thinking. And it offers a, a way of looking at everything really um, – a way we can, we can get meaning uh, arising from our engagement with each other and with the, essentially with the cosmos. And one last question, which is, um, if you had to deliver one message to everybody hearing this, one soundbite from this, what would it be? That you are the change that can happen. And it's not something, it's not a spectator sport. That everything, the decisions that each of us make each day and the connections we make with each other each day are the things that are going to determine our future. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you for all of your work. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Jeremy Lent. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. 